right, welcome to Musically Meditative Podcast, your favorite podcast, your favorite podcaster, Joe Riley. And across the table from me, I have Mr. Patrick Buck. Pat. What's up, man? How are you? Good. All right, this is a, a bonus episode off the record. It's our first follow-up, and you either came here from the video you just watched on YouTube, and for those that are unaware of that, we're going to have a link for our video in the description of this podcast episode. So if you're just listening like you normally do, thank you. We appreciate it. Make sure you click that YouTube video and watch this uh, episode that we're talking about here. And remember, too, everyone, that we've had a YouTube channel since day one. Unfortunately, it took a break. Uh, about We took a break from it about six months ago. Had a different um, producer step in, different you know recording location. But episodes 48 through 85 have actual video of us in the studio for those episodes so check those out you can see our faces if if you know if that interests you if you want to well my face my face won't be on any of those videos no pat's not there but you know in the future we'll do that again but yeah you're going to be able to find all the off the record episodes on our youtube channel so hit that subscribe button uh furthermore we want everyone to remember to hit subscribe on whatever podcast app that you're listening to Apple's really important because you could leave a five-star rating or you can actually leave a comment. You would just have to sign in with your email or something like that. But if you do that five-star rating and leave a comment, that bumps us up in the algorithm. And we're doing well. We have a pretty, a pretty decent amount of ratings. I think 40, but hey, we'd like to see 40 more or 140 more because I know, you know, we see the numbers, right, Pat? And they're doing well. So yeah. please just everybody remember to do that. And if you're on Spotify too, hit follow. Pat, you said you listen on Google Play, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, the last person in uh, uh, North America without an iPhone, so I <laughs> I, 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 I download uh, third world apps. There you go. But yeah, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. You get your podcast fix, iHeartRadio, all that. But if you have an iPhone and you're listening on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever the hell you want to call it, hit that five star button and leave a comment and rate us. We, we would love that. So this is what we're going to do with this episode. We're going to talk about our experience at Region Records, why we picked the albums that we did, dive into our personal background and stories about these records. Uh, then we're going to do some details about the album that we picked, you know, the particular pressing, uh, why it appealed, appealed to us. Then we're going to give you a little bit of background details uh, about that particular album or record, you know, uh, the production, maybe some tidbits, right, Pat? Yeah. All right. And then we're going to close it out with our next filming location and when that uh, episode should be released. So let's just start this off. Uh, Region Records is where we just left from, and it's in Griffith, Indiana. It's across the street from New Ober Falls. And Pat, why do you like Griffith and why do you like Region Records? Griffith is cool, man. Uh, there's a lot of cool things popping up in Griffith right now you wouldn't think 10 years ago it'd be a fun place to hang out but uh yeah Regent Records is uh probably my favorite record store I I buy most of my records online and um it, for me that's kind of like uh picking out a movie to watch at home if there's a specific thing you just buy it on demand for six bucks and you watch it, it sometimes you just want to go on Netflix and browse and that's kind of like going to a record store you, you're not probably gonna not gonna find what you want uh, specifically, but uh, you'll be surprised. There's uh, a lot of cool stuff in there, and uh, Region Records seems to be the place uh, with the fastest turnaround. They never keep stuff very long. He he's selling stuff super cheap and always buying uh, just you know dozens of crates. So if you go there and you go back a week later, there's a good chance you won't see the same stuff. So that's that's a big plus there. Yeah, it's forever changing inventory, and uh, you know he gets newer stuff, but he also has first pressings and you know classic rock punk metal new wave a little bit of hip-hop but not very much that's why the record that i found i was pretty ex excuse me excited and uh yeah i love griffith too they're doing a lot of cool things their new Oberfalls is nice s and j records too which we'll probably end up doing an episode at i've been buying records from from them for 20 years yeah uh gabe too at grindhouse so yeah shout out to griffith but josh you know he has a uh a cool vibe about him. He's definitely this is the owner of uh, Region Records. He's he's a music he's a music head. Um, he's very knowledgeable about all the different genres. I know he likes a lot of like psych rock, and he's very um, I don't know into his region 
and like the oldies like he he has like these crazy 45s and i'll come in there and be like joe check this out and like you know he's like there's only like 10 of these dude i'm like cool and but he he really loves his music and if he knows like you like a particular artist he'll seek that shit out he'll sniff it out and he'll get it from whatever collector or wherever he's getting his records from because he um he did that for me with the smiths like i bought almost every one of their 12 inch singles like i probably bought like 35 of them that's nuts from josh because he sniffed it out someone had them you know they're all first pressings and shit from england and whatever but yeah josh knew about it and gave me a call he's like yeah I'm, i, I want to sell them all together so you know name me a price look the stuff up on discogs and, and shit like that and, yeah. and come back so I, I picked them up so it was, it was a nice buy but yeah if you get in good with him he might do that for you or like pat said just go there that's what's cool about not buying online like you might stumble across i don't know like just a a gym from your past or something nostalgic or you forgot about it yeah something you never think of um it's it's you you save a ton of money uh, i don't know how many times i've gone to band camp and you know dropped a couple of bills uh, so yeah it's it, he's got a lot of local bands too it's yeah it's really cool he'll that's like his prize thing he's got the case well, like the local pressings. Yeah, he's got all that liquids. Uh, liquids. They're from. They're from here, from our region in Northwest Indiana. They're kind of like a garage psych punk band. Mm-hmm. But I think they were signed to some Brazilian place. I, I don't know the backstory on them. Ask Josh. But yeah, he has all their original pressings. And we're not good with what country bands are from. Well, apparently. I know they're from here, but they got <laughs> right. Yeah, listen to some of our other episodes. Pat and I, I don't, I don't know. Monolord's from Sweden, by the way. Oh, are they? Yeah, so I'm an asshole. Okay. Sorry, Sorry Monolord. <laughs> we knew it was somewhere over there. Top 10 didn't know where they're from. Didn't know what <laughs> hemisphere they're in. Ugh. But uh, yeah, Josh has got a really cool store and, you know, his, his personality shines. You could buy like old turntables there. You know, he's got like weird furniture old street signs uh you know tape players vhs players toys i remember he had like these comic books that were like classic rock bands so there's like all these like these comics of led zeppelin and like black sabbath i'm like what the hell is this he's got like planes trains and automobiles on vhs in case you're hunting down a copy you know where to (laughs) go right i think i bought like some cool Nirvana cassettes just for nostalgic reasons. And I kind of want to get back into cassettes, man. That's the thing now. They got a cool sound. I mean, remember they would always bump like the dudes back in the day. If you if you if you had a sound system and you really like wanted to bump, like put a tape in. It's the best for the sound system. Dude, all the new uh, metal bands are releasing cassettes now, and they're like eight dollars. I know, I like it. It's cool. I might have to maybe do that and save some money. <laughs> It'll just be a whole nother area to put all of your stuff, and it's just gonna take over your house oh no (laughs) your girlfriend should like that pat yeah but uh yeah let's move on to to our recording experience we did that with ryan from ghost team creative uh pat and i by no means are like hollywood type dudes no and it took like 11 takes that one time remember i was walking and didn't you like fall down or walk into a tree with a microphone yeah i was walking backwards (laughs) on the worst sidewalk (laughs) holding a boom mic and uh, I, was, I was super hungover, and uh, yeah, I bit it. But yeah, we got it done after all, all the assholes honking their horns. Yeah, people honking their horns. I take it back. I don't like Griffith. Yeah, yeah, Griffith. <laughs> what the hell? But yeah, people were honking their horns and yelling obscenities at us. But you know, shit happens. Yeah, it was still fun. Um, yeah. So I think moving forward, we'll have more of a a direction and an approach, and just a little bit of gray hairs on our chin for doing it, right, Pat? Like that was all a. Uh, uh, us experimenting and working with one another because you and i really didn't even know each other that well before that no no we went to that beer fest and that yeah, was it that i forgot about yeah <laughs> you forgot about. <laughs> yeah and then ryan as well like i i mean i know i'm pretty decent but you know it was all kind of like a, a one-time first deal and then after this we actually recorded what we're doing now but in front of video and whatnot but i guess it was kind of rough and there was some problems with the audio so ryan ditched it so what we're going to do moving forward is Go to record stores in the Chicagoland area and here in the region. If you're listening to and you're somewhere else in the country, let us know. Maybe we can come out there sometime. But if anything, if we're on vacation, we'll come into your record store and give it a rating and shout it out on the podcast. But, yeah, I think moving forward, we'll definitely have uh, some more interaction and some fun on the episodes. You know, it was a good learning experience. Yeah. I think it went pretty well. It did go well. Um, But, yeah, everybody check out Ryan, too, Ghost Team Creative. And I think moving forward, we we all know our um, position, I guess. 
you know, and we have Ryan involved and he wants to stay with us. So everyone look for like an episode probably every 90 days. Ain't yeah, pet? that'd be cool. And uh, YouTube is the place to to do it. So just search Musically Meditated on YouTube and smash that subscribe button. But let's do this. Let's just move on to the records that we uh, we purchased. So, like I said, you can't always find and you won't always find hip hop at Region Records. But I stumbled across the Low End Theory by A Tribe Called Quest. And, you know, this is one of those hip hop classics. I don't really remember it that much when I was younger, but uh, I started to get into tribe like early college. Uh, I just I, I really remember like going to house parties. Remember that shit? Like going down to Indiana Bloomington and you would go to like the villas. And I was never invited to any parties ever in my life. No, <laughs> no, I remember that. Remember that era? And the funny thing about that is I know this sounds weird, but uh, low end theory is in, in a very distant way. It's kind of like the Beatles where you you heard these songs before and you're like, you know, I re-listened to the record and I'm like, oh, fuck, that's they did that song. Right. You know, that's I mean, that's the only way I'll connect them to the Beatles before. No, that makes sense. I like, yeah, like that. I didn't yeah. know that that was them until I like have it on my screen in front of me and i'm like oh fuck i didn't know that they did that song yeah so yeah i i've heard their music more often than i didn't even know yeah they're classic uh there's something too like with q-tip's voice that i always enjoyed in the production but that's what it brings me back to because this album came out in 1991 i was not jamming this when i was eight or nine years old or however old i was in 91 like it wasn't it wasn't on heavy rotation i was more into like vanilla ice and poison at that time yeah, like real rap and uh <laughs> good metal <laughs> yeah yeah real rap and good metal vanilla ice and poison uh so i don't really recall like a tribe but i do remember uh you know mtv you know, yo mtv raps and i vaguely remember q-tip and tribe because they were kind of coming out of that zulu nation vibe and the other other hip-hop groups at the time was like kmd that's where mf doom came from uh De, De La so how do you say that De La Soul. Thank you. I don't know why I can't talk right now. But yeah, De La Soul. Uh, I'm trying to think. Were there any other ones? They were just kind of colorful, more of like a positive vibe. And right, yeah. Like a, a just a, a real I don't know, authentic hip-hop thing going on. But back to the Indiana University, I just remember this was the, like the Napster era. So you could download a lot of shit. And I was really into Wu-Tang Clan in like the early 2000s. And my friends would just rip shit off a of Napster all the time. And I think a tribe called Quest was just always there because it was that East Coast hip hop. So we would always put this record on at these parties in the in the villas they call it. It was like the apartment complexes on campus, you know, where all the freshmen could stay. Remember how that shit worked back then? Yeah. So we were always jamming it, man. But uh, you know, musically I guess the production is what really stands out. Uh I think Pete Rock did this. Help me out, hip hop hip hop heads if I'm wrong. I know Q tip the main MC had a lot to do with it too, but uh, like I said, his flow is great. You know, there's a lot of uh, colorful lyrical content that catches my attention by him and Fife Dog, and I, I know it's definitely the birth of jazz rap. You know, you hear that term a lot now, but they're sampling a lot of old school jazz records on this, and it just it, it just has this cool, I don't know, like laid back vibe to it. I think the the guy that got to record the bass is like uh, I don't know his name. But he's like a, a famous jazz bass player. Oh, really? He's done like two thousand recordings or something. So there is. I know that there is live bass on this, right? I thought there was live drums on this, but it's not. It's not. No, I looked it up, and uh, it it kind of sounds like it. It does. There's something. The the way like I forget which which song it is exactly, but the snare is so tight. Like the snare yeah. just really pops through. I don't I don't know if it's scenario. Scenario is like one of my favorites. That's like Busta Rhymes' first debut. And I know Brand Nubians on this record too, but Buster Rhymes really, really comes out. But the bass just really just plummets through you. You know, it kind of just sounds good in the speakers, man. I love a, a, a great bass. But it is their second album. Came out in '91. It's Q-Tip and Fife Dog, and uh, I forget the main DJ producer's name. They were a, a three-piece. It's Muhammad something. Sorry, Ali. Don't. don't. <laughs> yeah, Muhammad Ali. On his downtime. He... But great mix of jazz, funk, and soul. You know, it's uh, like the beats are basic boom bap and the simplicity kind of, I don't know, it's comforting for me going back. I think it dates it just a touch, but, you know, there's there's a lot of warmth there, like I mentioned, and those jazz samples just really 
are soothing, you know, um, you kind of, they kind of brought a different sound at the time. Cause if you think back in 1991, this was like the height of gangster rap. I mean, you had like oh, yeah. NWA, then you had like in your face, public enemy, you had the ghetto boys. And this was kind of like a step in a different direction and a step back, you know, focusing on like different cultural aspects of hip hop and, you know, kind of bring in more of a, uh, I don't know, a positive vibe and then, you know, a playful vibe as well. So I don't know, man. It's just I had to I had to get this record like immediately when I saw it. Uh, Q-Tip's voice also is just I don't know, man. It, it just really uh, just suit, like it, it just goes well. Like I, he always stuck out to me. I don't know. So Fife Dog, too, like he really makes a name for himself with this. He's more playful, more funny. And he passed away about five years ago. And I read, too, that uh, this was their second album and he was probably going to just quit. But Q-Tip talked him into it because he found out he was diabetic. So he was a really, really bad diabe- like diabetic, and it caught up to him. But, uh, yeah, man, great rap duo. The narratives are fun, you know, reflective, positive, awesome storytelling. You know, great conscious hip-hop. And they, like, rap about shit in the music industry that they don't really care for. And then they have that one song, Date Rape. Did you re-listen to that one? Uh, no, I'm only familiar with the Sublime version. Oh, that's right. I forgot about <laughs> <laughs> with the bass. I wonder if they stole that from them, the idea. But no, it's a like I know when Q-Tip raps, he's uh, his main his main verse is about like a girl leading him on. And then he could tell that she's losing interest. So he doesn't pursue her anymore because he doesn't want her to take it the wrong way or say something bad about him, you know, like in a rapey kind of vibe. And uh, then Fife Dog actually raps about a girl that he had sex with you know, multiple times and then being accused of rape later. So this is some shit that, you know, was ahead of its time in a sense. Like, nobody was rapping about this shit in 91. So it was pretty pretty good stuff. No, they were just doing it. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, they were just doing it. But, uh, yeah, man, that's, that's it. That's all I got to, like, say about it musically. And then uh, the version that I picked up it was a second pressing, I believe, and it was, like, the 1996 one. So they took a while i know it's on jive records but it took a while for them to repress it and put it back out there so i don't know like for those listening to the whole thing with like first pressing and blah 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 like if you're just starting off collecting i wouldn't worry about that so much just get something that's brand new because you never know the condition of a record you know like you you, you could actually listen to it at record stores like region records or you can like i don't know look at it and look at the surface scratches ain't it pat yeah, uh, get something that you're gonna want to, you know, play a lot. Don't yeah. put, don't buy records to say, oh, I have a first pressing. I'm a, I'm afraid because I haven't, you know, replaced a stylus on my uh, turntable in two years. Yeah, I don't want to mess it up. Buy stuff, you know. Buy I buy new records all the time and I play them all the time. So yeah, that's the most important thing. And then after a while, you can start looking for first pressings. Sell the repress that you bought, you know, a couple years back. I do that all the time. Yeah, it's better to buy that first pressing or the like second or whatever. Like if you're actually there to see the physical copy. Yeah, I mean online, if you buy it off of eBay or something, they'll they'll put the rating of the mint. Everything condition. is near mint. Everything, Everything ever <laughs> right? near mint. So, like I said, just just as a start off point, just buy new shit. I mean this this record, you can find uh, low in theory anywhere and everywhere. I think I saw it at Bam Books, and it's just. It's it, available. It's it's gotta be on Amazon. Yeah, it's on Amazon. But I I just when I saw that ninety six. It's like I gotta get this. I gotta yeah, get this. That's pretty cool. And it's and in, in great. It's a double one too. It's a double LP. That's cool. And back then, people were only buying CDs, so they probably didn't press that many copies of this because no. like now they're selling more vinyl than CDs, and they're making thousands of them. Yep. So this one, yeah, there could only be like two hundred. I I didn't look it up, but there only could be a couple hundred. Uh, pressings of this one yeah i don't remember the exact price on it i know like with our with our challenge here we had 30 bucks so that's exactly how much he was asking and i thought that was the perfect pick like just blow my wad right then and there and that's why i picked it sounds hot thanks all right pat let's move on to uh your reasoning behind uncle acid yeah i um i happened to find uh uncle acid in the deadbeats volume one and that's pretty cool because they first recorded that uh, 10 years ago and they don't they did like 30 best buy cdrs um it's really hard to find like an old uh and so it's a repress it's from like 2018 uh first thing that caught my eye it's uh purple colored vinyl 
and I have every other Uncle Acid album on purple vinyl. So now I have the full set. I had to buy it. That's badass. And uh, yeah, uh, one of my favorite bands too. Um, I didn't even know this one existed until a few years ago. So uh, you know, I was eyeballing it online, and then it was there in front of me. So yeah, I had to buy it. And it was used too, right? Wasn't it a used one? I thought so because it wasn't. Uh, it was with the new albums. But it it wasn't uh, like Sealed. cellophaned. Yeah, it didn't even have a plastic sleeve. I don't know. It could have been new, but um, either way, it, you know, mine was less than thirty bucks, so I had to, I just snag that one. And it's cool to find something you really like, <coughs> something like on your wish list in person. You know, yeah. it's like going and picking out a dog at the pet store. Absolutely. And here I've been buying dogs online forever <laughs> for so many dogs from China. No. <laughs> but yeah, man, uh, Uncle Acid like looking into the history of this it was their first recording like pat had mentioned uh it was only available on cdr so they just burnt it themselves is what that means for yeah. all you listening all you old heads you know exactly what i'm talking about and they probably only handed it out to a few friends and then um kevin Starr is the singer uh main lead guitarist and i believe he plays the organ for uncle acid yep and he put this up on myspace and only youtube and it like attracted a lot of people so they kept asking him about his band and you know he didn't really take it that serious from what i from what i read and then finally i think they came out with bloodlust after this right yeah after this um bloodlust uh i think after that it was uh mind control, mind control. yeah because bloodlust they did the same thing uh they initially only released that on cdr and they had 100 copies but then it was re-released by uh, Rise Above Records. And then, you know, he regrouped all the members after that again. And like you said, went to Mind Control. So, yep. yeah, man, they're, they're, they're an awesome band. They're from Cambridge, England. I've seen them a couple times live. I think I shared that on our, uh, I did, on our top, what was it, our top ten of the One decade? Of, yeah, something like that. Uh, of 2019. But they were an amazing band. Like, I saw them twice. The first time they were great. Both times were at the Metro. But this most recent time I saw him about a year ago, I think they got a uh, a new bass player, maybe a drummer. Don't quote me, but they were on man, and that's cool. You know, uh, like they I don't know they were just a great great band, and they really embody that old school doom and rock and roll sound. But this album, going back to uh, what's it called again? What do you mean? This the one we're talking about, the Uncle Acid record oh, that you uh, picked out. Just volume one. Volume one. It's a uh, very lo fi. And it's got a, I don't know, a total garage vibe to it, don't it? Yeah, the newer albums are very lo-fi, and it's obviously intentional. But it makes you wonder, was that the intention when they were recording in you know, someone's basement? Or is that what came out as the end result? And then say, oh, you know, we kind of like this moving forward. Uh, there's a lot of arguments between you know, other basement dwellers about, is it like doom metal, stoner rock? We go through that a lot. With Uncle um, Acid, right? Yeah. What are they exactly? It doesn't matter, though. It's it's awesome. Uh, really cool 70s vibe. Yes. And it's the right time, too. Like, the 2010 through, like, now, it, everyone's going deep into, you the know. doom. The, and, and the throwback sound, the old Sabbath sound. Everyone loves it. So, yeah, it's a great band and a right time, right place for this to come out. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm trying to think, too. Bloodlust was dope. Mind Control is my favorite. And then they came out with another one. The Watchman or Watcher or something a few years ago, right? Oh, that was um, how was that? Uh, Night Creeper. Night Creeper is similar to that, and that's one thing I really like about this album. This is like the roots, and you could tell like almost every album after this, like, uh, is like a concept album, and it came from like a song here. They have a song called "Dead Eyes of London," and that's just like the whole album. Night Creeper. It's about like a Jack the Ripper style uh, killer cop. In England, or Bobby, I guess. Yeah. Uh, they have a song called Witch's Garden, and that's like bloodlust. Um, it's about like uh, witch burnings and rituals in the woods. And um, they have another song called uh, Do What Your Love Tells You. And it's uh, it's kind of like about a cult leader that comes down from the mountains and brainwashes people. You know, mind control. That's mind control. That whole album, I, I think we forgot to mention that. That's what that's all about, ain't it? Yeah. It's, it's a concept album of someone living on top of a mountain. Comes down, and right. yeah. Uh, so it's cool. Like, every, you know, you see where all of their albums came from based on, you know, this collection of thoughts that's volume one. And it's cool. It came out, you know, to the mass 
uh, to the masses after all those. So now you can look back and like, oh, goddamn, like, fuck, that's like Dead Eyes of London, like, is like Night Creeper. Yeah. So that's one of my favorite things about it. I love all all the concepts and uh, uh, the storytelling that uh, Kevin Stars does in uh, all of his albums. Yeah, he's a great uh, he's a great lyricist, but a, an awesome singer. He has his own sound. We mentioned before either you love him or hate him. I love it. But live too, man, he kills it. Like singing wise, but on guitar, like all of his solos and shit. Like I was really, really, really impressed with his guitar playing. Like yeah. I was like, damn, man, like. They all kind of look like uh, Cousin It up there because you can't see their face. (laughs) And I just want to see their faces. And then sometimes it pops out. It's like, oh, there's his face. There he is. There, there, there's Uncle Acid. But uh, yeah, he's a good guitar player. And on volume one, uh, you hit really cool solos. And I would have thought he developed more of of a as a guitar player. And I know he seems like he was solid, like, you know, when he was recording in a, a garage onto a CDR from day one. Right. Yeah. I forget too. Like I'm, a, I'm a gear nerd, and from from what I remember, they didn't have full stacks or anything. Like they just had maybe like a two ten combo Fender, but you couldn't even see it. Like it was on the ground, or they were hiding all their shit. Yeah. But Uncle Acid had this really neat. Uh, I think it's a Les, a Les Paul Junior. Like they made very very limited amounts of them. Whoever's listening, if you know exactly what Kevin Starr's using, like reach out and send us a message on Instagram or, uh, you know, musically meditated at Gmail. But yeah, I think it's called like a June, a Les Paul junior. Yeah. I, I've never really paid attention to what he plays. Uh, I real, honestly, I haven't seen like, uh, too much, too many videos of him playing. I never really, uh, noticed. Or it's like a Les Paul that came out. I don't know. I don't want to say Les Paul. Maybe it's a Gibson that came out right before the Les Paul. Like it was like a trial period. So I want to say it was like the later fifties, but I know it's a, a, a Gibson Jr. or something. And I think his is like a an orangish yellow and it had like a black pit guard. But I pay attention to that shit. I'm like, what is he playing? And then I had to like really, really search online. Mm-hmm. And it was something to that nature, like a little early version of a Les Paul type thing. But I think they made it for kids or whatnot. But man, their sound was great live. And, you know, uh, another thing, too, that I remember, they opened with uh, Cut You Down. And just like right when those drums kick in, just like set it off. And everybody was throwing down really, really hard, which kind of like I didn't get that, like moshing. I'm like, how are you moshing to Uncle Acid? Like they were throwing down like circle pits and shit. I'm like, this is too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, people will get in. They'll start a pit for uh, like, you know, uh, 40 beats per minute do metal. And they're like, oh, uh, how? Stop it. Yeah. I mean, if they're grinding or blasting for sure. But no, they were, they were, they were getting down. And then 13 Candles, like, I still hear his uh, vocals from that, like, in my head live. You know, he's got that kind of nasally howl about him. Yeah. He's got a, he's got a pretty cool voice. He's got a little, uh, little Lennon in his voice, I think. Yes. Too. Yep. Yeah. He does. He little does. Ozzy. But, you know, everyone wants to be like Ozzy. So. That's expected. This is true. This is true. But uh, you got anything else to say about that record? Like why it, Why else you, it, it popped out to you? It was just you kind of wanted to complete the whole Uncle, Ac- Un- Uncle Acid discography, and it was purple. Yeah, and it was uh, it was only $20, so then I had money for lunch. So that's why I bought it. <laughs> yeah, and we went and drank some, some brew, oh, some yeah. brouhaha. But uh, right on, man. So, yeah, that's, that's why we picked those records, uh, you know. And we're gonna we're gonna jam them, man. But let's uh, let's close this one out with our next episode that we're gonna do with Off the Record, and we're gonna go to Tom's Record Bin in Hobart, Indiana. So I think that'll come out. Let me think here. When are we gonna record that? Late February. I think so. Yeah. So it'll probably be out uh, late March, early April. So everybody be on the lookout for that. You know, Tom's been on the on the podcast before. He's been a legendary uh, DJ in the area for rock and roll. He has awesome musical acts, so go check him out uh, at his record store. It's right in downtown Hobart. I don't remember the address, but it's right next to the Green Door Books or across the street from the uh, post office. But we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to throw in some other suggestions to the guys to, I don't know, have a little bit of fun. So you guys just wait and see that. And whoever, you know, would like to get involved and, and wants to come on the show, just reach out to us. We always want other people to come on, ain't it, Pat? Yeah, yeah. And like other record stores, are are there any records that you're looking for off the top of your head? I know I'm throwing you on the spot at times that you do not have, like going into it. Is there anything you're looking for? 
uh, yeah, at this point, I've been buying so many uh, newer albums. Uh, I've been neglecting, like, older stuff, older, like, thrash metal, older, um, you know, I don't expect to see a, a ton of death metal there, but... Uh, yeah, like, you know, old, old pressings of, like, Slayer, stuff like that. Uh, if I see anything like that, I'll definitely grab it. Um, you know, and other rock other rock albums, too. It doesn't have to be, like, super heavy. I can ap- appreciate, you know, almost everything. So maybe some original pressing, old school metal, or old school classic rock? Yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot of what I have are uh, represses. Okay. So I can uh, give those away to some friends if I, uh, you know, find uh, some old ones I have had my eye on. I remember... Uh from what I recall, I haven't been there in a while to buy a record, but I bought a lot of S- Smith shit there. Like he has very good original um, '80s new wave stuff. I remember seeing some heavy metal, and then he also has a good mixture of new albums. And, oh, okay. You know what I mean? So he he blends in the originals with the new stuff pretty good, and then he had uh, Tool Ten Thousand Days there. So I don't have that actual CD yet. Okay. But, like, you know, the, the main thing that they released, I did see that the last time I was in there. So maybe I'll okay. pick that up on the side. That's cool. But I know I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to look for. Uh, probably something original. And then if not, then we'll see what kind of new stuff he has. He kind of keeps it rotating on a regular basis. But for those that haven't been there, check it out. He does, like, live recordings for his radio station. I was on there with him before. We, uh, about a year ago, we went over Led Zeppelin 1 on the anniversary and it's 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 on SoundCloud. Maybe we'll throw it in the link there. But and then we went over Nirvana Bleach as well. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was a good time. And then like you could actually listen to the record there before you buy it if you want. And then he has all cool like stuff on the wall. Like he's got a Pantera Great Southern Trend Kill poster signed by the entire band. You know, just all kinds of crazy shit. He's met a lot of people. He's interviewed a lot of people. Oh, so, I bet. Yeah. So he has a cool uh, a cool vibe in there. But yeah, for those that want to get involved and join us. Just reach out, and if you're a record store and you want us to come, check out your record store and, uh, you know, put you out there. We're more more, more than willing to do that for you, ain't it, Pat? Yeah, yeah, and that's cool that you can, um, you know, listen to, you know, put a record on the record player and listen to it in the store. That's uh, that's awesome. You don't see that Mm-mm. too much anymore. It's yeah. really, uh, like, it's like being, like, in an old-school store before, you know, you had – um you know stream i'm I'm talking like i'm like an 80 year old man before you had like you know uh streaming services and everything you you pick out something you like and play it i remember broadway music do you remember that i do or remember block, blockbuster music i remember that too you were you took the cd and they'd open it and they had a listening center yeah, that amazing. was nuts man that was and those cds were so expensive back then i didn't buy any of them i just listened to them there and then i went home they're like 35 bucks <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's got the paper sleeve on the uh, you know, Cowboys from Hell, Pantera. So, you know, the paper sleeve oh, yeah. over it's another 10 bucks. Or uh, Tape World, not to get too far off the subject, but do you remember Tape World no. in the mall? Yeah. I, don't All know, they I remember had... Coconuts. I Coconuts, remember... too, was over tape there. Tape World? Tape World was in the mall like on the corner and it was just all tapes and then they finally got CDs and the shit was like 40 bucks a CD. Ugh. Back in the, back in the, I don't even How want to say good old days. How old are you? I'm only 36. <laughs> But yeah, that Damn. was like the '90s, probably all the way up to the mid '90s. They had Tape World. I don't know. You have a good memory, dude. I don't remember any of that. I do, man. I think you're like the Highlander. <laughs> you fucking been here for like 400 years. That's right. But yeah, yeah, yeah everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Come back. You know, go back to that that YouTube video of, if you have not seen it yet. It'll be here in the description of this episode. And uh, hit subscribe. And if you want to join us, reach out. Pat, thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, go to my Instagram, Macho Man Patrick Savage, all one word. Yeah, Pat's got quite the record collection. But, yeah, everybody reach out uh, and, and keep an eye out for the next episode, probably late March, April, Tom's Record Bin in Hobart, Indiana. And we'll see you later. Adios.